Uh, today I'll be talking about Snap's journey to standardizing internal Auth-Z. Uh, and right before we get started, I want to give a shout out to my team. And this is the real representation of all of us. As you can see, I'm a gopher. Uh, so to start off with, uh, with this talk, I want to talk about the, the agenda, which is basically we're going to look at like what the previous landscape of internal Auth-Z at Snap looked like. And then we're going to look at the concerns we wanted to address. And then we'll look at the potential solutions we investigated, the solution we ended up going with, and expanding support for that solution to be able to address other services. And then finally, uh, the outcome and the current landscape. OK, so uh, before we got started, we looked at like teams are uh, implementing their own variations of Auth-Z. And there were hard-coded Auth-Z solutions uh, implementations everywhere. Um, which also have like you know, uh, they take a lot of uh, time to update, and sometimes even taking up to a week, which is like very typical and usually how people do Odyssey. And uh, then there was also some teams that wanted like an out of the box solution, so they were leveraging Google Groups, which could potentially get out of hand as the complexity of the solution grew. So before just uh, going for a solution, we also want to highlight the 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 goals that we wanted to accomplish. And basically, we want to build a standardized Auth-Z solution. Uh, and we wanted to do this so we could have like a strong control over enforcement of uh, access control policies. And this is important so we can have like good analytics for DNR, which is required to have like, you know, if you, if you don't know what the principle is and the actions they can perform, you know, um, so it makes it a lot more difficult. And then the other part is like we already saw that some teams wanted an out-of-box solution. So we, we could provide them by you know, giving a out-of-box solution that could be like more scalable and more I could address the uh, issues they wanted to. So let's look at why did we go over, uh, why did we pick OPA over implementing our own solution? Um, so we did an internal feasibility uh, study, which kind of uh, came to the conclusion. A couple of uh, the reasons why we ended up picking OPA over here is basically uh, that it provides adequate flexibility for creating different types of access controls, right? And then uh, despite initially the implementation time was going to be the same if we ended up creating our own solution from scratch versus using OPA. But uh, the advantage we get is like as uh, we, we want to pivot or we want to use diff apply, uh, allow for like different kinds of policies, OPA would give us advantage for development time in the long run. And also, since OPA is open source, uh, we get like good community support and you know good reliability and security. Uh, lastly, also it's like a big plus to not have to release a new version of our application every time we want to uh, make an update to the policy evaluation logic. Um, other nice to have features are basically some of which we heavily leverage our unit tests and dynamic data loading. Uh, so yeah, so it was kind of like a no-brainer to go. Well, it, it was like a good decision to go with OPA at that time. Or it still is. <laughs> uh, OK, so I'm going to talk about the solution now. So right now, we know that we want to um, use OPA. We know what the problem is. We know the goals we want to achieve. Uh, but then we can't just get developers to straight up use uh, OPA directly. Because there's a, the, the two main reasons are like there's a learning curve associated with OPA, one being that, you know, People have to go on, uh, get onboarded with Rego. And the other part being that um, you want to deploy Rego or you want to deploy OPA in a way that it doesn't hinder performance, and which was, you know, people would not get on board if it didn't, if it uh, decreased their performance. Also, it would, uh, like, we would not be able to achieve one of our main goals, which is basically the loss of standardization. We wanted to standardize uh, Otzi. So, what is the solution here? So basically, we created a centralized RBAC solution for internal services. And we did this by abstracting away OPA from the end users. And we kind of modeled our service uh, like IAM roles uh, from AWS, so it's more intuitive for users. Um, I'll talk about the two main components of our, uh, of our solution, basically being a portal. Portal is like this uh, API and also provides like a front end flow that translates to regular policies. Uh, it's an intuitive UI for managing policy data that goes into uh, OPA bundles. And whenever there's like a change in like the policy data, it 
generates new bundles and publishes them to S3 buckets and GCP buckets in multiple availability zones. And then the second component of the solution is basically the evaluator, which is like the which is like this lightweight service provided, uh, providing a simple interface for OPA decision evaluations. The, this, uh, this evaluator, which I know is a great name, uh, the, uh, pulls in OPA bundles to be utilized locally, and we usually have it deployed through a sidecar in our service mesh, or Kubernetes, uh, any Kubernetes solution actually, uh, service. So with this solution, we were able to get uh, initial adoption of 15 services, uh, some of them being really important services, uh, services managing endpoints in our network, uh, services managing deployment, deployments, data flow jobs, and backend resources for a lot of services. And at this point, we still had s some issues with like getting more services on board because we didn't have support for non-Kubernetes services, and also it um, the current availability and the SLA requirements for um, for our most critical services, they could not be met with, like our service could not ma match those at this time. So I wanna talk about how we expanded support to be able to service all of those different uh, um, new consumers that we want to get on board. So this is for the non-Kubernetes solution. Like I mentioned earlier, the evaluator service, in this case you can see we kind of uh, deployed it to um, the Kubernetes cluster, and we'll start out from number one, which is basically we're pushing OPA bundles whenever there's a change, whenever there's changes, and then we update, uh, we push them to S3 buckets and GCP storage, and basically they get pulled in to by the evaluator service, and uh, the services identify which pods or which containers they want to go to based on like the headers, right? So the, the services, the end services will self-identify using the headers. And then uh, our internal infrastructure will direct them to the right right pods. So this way you can see we, we can service like all the services that are not in Kubernetes. But the problem is like, I mean, well, you have to sacrifice latency in this case to be able to achieve that. So now I want to talk about like, uh, the really interesting solution. I mean, the other one is really uh, interesting too, but this one is basically handing um, high availability and low latency basically for our critical solutions or critical services. And instead of just going over this text, I'll go over this diagram, but basically talk about everything I just showed. Um, so like before, we have our portal which pushes bundle changes, right? It pushes them to the buckets. But in this case, as you'll see, like, so the main, so, uh, before I will continue, I want to say that so some of our most critical services are in our service mesh, right? So basically, in this case, we'll push uh, the OPA bundles to config maps for the Kubernetes clusters, and then we have the evaluator service, in this case, much closer to the service containers themselves as a sidecar in our auth sidecar. It, it has auth, uh, auth n and auth z. Uh, basically, from that, it has like a higher level of availability. And the reason for that is basically the uh, the buckets, uh, S3 buckets and GCP buckets, don't have as high of an SLA. Uh, so by being able to push to config maps, we're able to achieve like a much higher availability, right? And then the other parts is that the, the evaluator service is really close to the end service, right? So, and the calls themselves are made by gRPC. Um, to further increase performance, and then we have caching for all of the decisions in the services through our libraries, and then uh, that also improves like latency, basically. Um, yeah, so this is basically talking about how we're able to get like the higher level of availability. So now armed with these new two um, uh, like expansions of our solution we're able to reach a much higher scale because we can get all of the services in Snap onboarded now. Yeah, so basically we're able to get to a scale of um, 1.2 billion queries made per minute to our cache results. And then the queries that are not, uh, like the queries that go further than the cache to the actual servers are 700,000 queries made uh, per minute to our evaluator servers. And then we have daily peaks of 45,000 um, OPA instances at any, at um, yeah at our daily peaks. So, as you can see, we were able to get to, uh, get a solution, and we were able to get some scale on it. And 
I think everyone or a lot of people have uh, realized that the, the thing, I don't think like the technical part of a solution is the hardest part usually. The biggest problem with any solution is the adoption. So I wanna talk about how we were able to get so many services on board to our solution. And then, and on top of that, the other problem or like one of the issues we faced is that, that every service that's coming on board, they need to be moving their policies onto our solution, right? So they might not have the exact RBAC policy, or they might not have a good RBAC policy. So we have to help them or support them to come on board with that, or just to uh, onboard their policy on our solution, right? So initially, we allocated a lot of resources to support onboarding ser services to be able to accomplish that. And then uh, it, uh, it, uh, it got better slowly over time because of, uh, you know, we, we could gap the uh, uh, knowledge, uh, we could complete the gaps in our knowledge for like the documentation, so improve documentation over time. And also uh, the other part is like, you know, we, ha we already have services on board, so you can see how they did it and it was much more easier for services to come on board. And then how do we get like more services on board? Uh, we start out by looking at like, big impact services first, and that's basically like services that could uh, get the most benefit from having a good um, policy like RBAC being implemented that they didn't have or they might not have uh, before. And then also the other one is like having critical services getting onboarded. Once you have like the big critical services onboarded, that kind of validates your idea and then everyone's like, okay, this is a, this is a good solution and it works. Uh, so they wanna, it's kind of like self advertisement of the solution and they wanna come on board. And the other part is like we have a commitment to improve access control practices by increasing features um, that help implement like, some good practices. And then we have like some other um, features that I talked about earlier. Um, yeah, so in summary, we have, uh, we talk about like the, the previous state of SNAP, uh, SNAP's internal Aussie, and then the current state of uh, Aussie, and then basically the case studies we did for the solutions, uh, the solution, we, we ended up implementing how we expanded the solution and the scale and the adoption. Uh, yeah, so thanks everyone. Can, can you tell us a little bit about the uh, growing pains that you had getting up to the scale that you reached? Like, like what, what were the, what things did you notice like crash or didn't work uh, like as you're trying to like build uh, your solution hit that, that, those scales and those peaks. The so uh, the main uh, so basically the main issue is like with the as uh, you're scaling up to the yeah, yeah for you to be able to handle forty five thousand opens a day yeah like I, like but the, like what what happened along your journey there that caused you or like what things happened that you didn't expect or like things that broke down as you were trying to say oh this is how we're going to create this many every day yeah. So I think uh, the the biggest thing was like we didn't get onboard uh, we didn't get like the most critical service onboard at first, right? So we could uh, handle some of those pains like beforehand, um, and then the the pains with like the actual uh, before we got to the point we where we got like the actual critical services we had like looked at like if there was any issues. But let me think of like a hmm, like a particular example. Um, I think. The, the the some of the like yeah the one of the main ones was like the S3 buckets one right uh, that uh, initially you look at that they're not able to provide the same level of availability that some services need right so a lot of those solutions that we came up with they were as a result of like us not being able to meet, meet like the exact uh, demands that were there right. Is there a kind of translation that happens to put the plug holes into a config map in case? And is there like any concern about like sensitive data going there? Uh, so basically, um, the sensitivity of the data is uh, it's kind of like we manage it through our internal um, uh, platform, right? So it's it's delivered through, and also like the main service we have that pushes this is also within our service mesh, right? So it kind of meets the uh, standard of the, the security standards of sen sending like any information through that, right? Um, we have yeah controls for that. Yeah. Uh, sorry, one one thing I did want to mention on on top of that, the uh, 
using config maps kind of just uh, it does limit us in a bit, in the sense that they have a one megabyte limitation. So that kind of limits it for like critical services to be able to scale beyond that as of right now. So right now we haven't hit the point that we're gonna, we're going to be at that limit. But uh, our plans uh, are to address that, and we're looking at a couple of solutions. And one being uh, probably like you know. Uh, sharding up the data, uh, like the, the policy um, policy bundles, but um, yeah, there might be other solutions as well because there's a lot of features coming out for Opa that might be useful as well. So, or like they are, yeah. Why config maps? Like because is it because you're mounting them, or why not just consume them directly with your servers? They consume them. So why, just, like, why why port them into config maps and use the config? Uh, so, the part about like getting the fly, uh, file there would that uh, that would be the external call that, like for example, like getting any changes to the file, right? If we want to uh, get those changes there, um, basically reliably and uh, that part itself, we're gonna have to pull those files uh, somehow, right? And the, those changes are made on our portal and like our other service, right? So the part about config maps is like okay, like once you push it to the config map. It's going to be available in the cluster right there, versus uh, if you have like any other way. It's like oh, if you bring up the file, right? That's that's still going to be like there's going to be some latency there, and then that's like the same as like making an outside call to S3 bucket. I mean, like it's not about the call. It's like the S3 buckets themselves also not being able to yeah service all the time. Any other questions? All right. Awesome. Thank you, Omar.